All right, well, I guess we'll get started. It's a little after 1.30 or 10.30, depending on where you are. Um, hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us for our first webinar of the 2024 Community Education Forum Series. My name is Tiana O'Reilly. I'm the Manager of Events and Chapter Development with the Huntington Society of Canada. We are so excited to have you join us and learn more about the relationship between speech language pathology and Huntington disease. Before I introduce you to our guest speaker today, I just want to make sure everyone is aware of how best to participate in today's webinar through Microsoft Teams. So um, if you would like to have some live captioning, there is a feature. If you go to the top bar and click the three dots um, for more, uh, scroll down to language and speech, and you can turn on the live caption fe feature and it'll show them just at the bottom of the screen. Just to note, we have uh, disabled your cameras and microphones for the duration of the webinar, just to allow for less feedback. Um, and if you're having any technical difficulties, please go to the Q&A button at the very top um, of the screen and submit any issues and we will uh, address them as they come up. It's also obviously where you would be able to submit uh, questions. So we have allocated a Q&A portion at the end of the webinar where we'll be able to go over any questions you submit. Feel free to send in questions throughout uh, the presentation and we can address them as we uh, go. Questions can be liked as well and commented underneath and we will start with the most rated first um, just because it will show what everybody really wants to know more about. Um, there is an option to keep your questions anonymous if that's what makes you feel comfortable, but just also note that if you comment on those questions, you're uh, you won't will no longer be anonymous. Um, and sometimes there can be a lag during the webinar. So if you can refresh by uh, clicking on the Q and A button and to close it, and then you can reopen it to refresh the box. Um, if you are kicked out of the webinar for any reason, you can just go ahead and click on the event link and, and we will admit you back in. So without further ado, uh, today we're thrilled to have Jasmine Cloud, uh, a registered and certified speech language pathologist in British Columbia. Jasmine helped create British Columbia's first full-time public SLP program for people with neurological movement disorders. These disorders include Huntington's disease, and we will be discussing signs and symptoms uh, and what you can do about them. So today we will learn about swallowing safety and red flags, speech, voice changes and treatment options, cognitive communication difficulties and management strategies saliva challenges, including drooling or dry mouth. And of course, we will answer your questions as they come. So without further ado, please welcome Jasmine. Fabulous, hello, can you hear me well? I can, we can. <laughs> Thank you for that wonderful introduction. I am so excited to be here today. Um, I do have some slides that I'm going to be showing you, so I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen here first. Just bear with me while I do that. Okay, I'm gonna make them nice and big so we can all read them. Do we have a thumbs up? Can you see that slide that says speech language pathology and Huntington's disease? Yeah, okay, okay, perfect. I got a thumbs up, that's excellent. All right, so yeah, that's the topic of today. If you are here to learn about speech language pathology, you are in the right place. I want to start off by giving a big thank you to the Huntington Society of Canada. They've put an enormous amount of work, <clears throat> excuse me, to bring you this wonderful education opportunity today. As a speech language pathologist, I'm always excited to see big organizations acknowledging the impact of allied health and ways to bring this education to people and make it more accessible. So thank you so much to the Huntington Society. Who am I? As was mentioned, my name is Jasmine. I am a registered and certified speech language pathologist coming to you today from beautiful British Columbia, specifically Vancouver Island on the west coast of Canada. I do have additional training in adult movement disorders, and that's kind of my area of specialty. I've listed here some of my advanced training, including being a trainer with the International Parkinson and Movement Disorder Society, which allows me to teach other healthcare professionals about adult neurological movement disorders. 
some disclosures about me. I am employed by Public Health at the Parkinson and Movement Disorders Clinic in Victoria, Canada. I'm also a clinical educator with the University of British Columbia, so I teach future speech language pathologists. I also volunteer with Speech and Hearing BC, working on ways to make resources more available and more accessible. I do also have a private practice specializing in adult neurological movement disorders. If you want to learn more, that's called Speak Strong. And I receive no compensation for the preparation or delivery of this workshop. I do have another disclosure that's really important, and that is that this webinar is for informational purposes only. All right, so we're not intending to replace or substitute medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment that you would have received from your qualified healthcare provider. If you have questions regarding your individual circumstance or condition, we always encourage you to talk to the team who know you best. All right, and the agenda for today, I am going to start by introducing us to speech language pathology in general. Um, I find that we're typically a lesser known profession and I think it's important that we have that foundational knowledge. I'll then go into how we can help with Huntington's disease and some of your assessment and treatment options as they pertain to things like communication, swallowing and more. At the end, I will have a few slides on ways you can speak, uh, seek speech language pathology care. And then as was mentioned, we will have time for questions. All right, what is speech language pathology? So speech language pathologists are health professionals and we work to identify, diagnose and treat both communication and swallowing disorders. So anything involving the anatomy of the face and throat is kind of our area of the body. Now we do this across the lifespan. And I bring this up because when people think about speech pathology, they typically think about somebody who helps children, maybe with articulation or stuttering. And while that is an area that some speech pathologists work in, the truth is we work with many more populations than that. I have colleagues who work in the pediatric floors of hospitals, helping babies with cleft palates or different diagnoses or trauma, helping them suckle and swallow safely. There are also speech pathologists who work in hospitals with things like strokes, inhalation burns, intubation injuries, oral and throat cancers, anything that can affect your ability to swallow safely and communicate. Some speech pathologists also work in the corporate or technological spheres, making Siri sound more human and helping your phone understand you better. So I bring this up because if you are looking for a speech language pathologist, it's very important that you find someone with experience and training in HD specifically. All right, because there's a lot of us and we work in different areas. So how can we help? I like to break it down into four main categories. The first one being speech and voice. So we help patients with HD on things like articulation, the quality and sound of their voice and the expression in the actual speech sounds needed to communicate. But we also work with cognitive communication. So more of the language components of expressing yourself, understanding other people, and the other factors needed to communicate successfully, like uh, memory and attention and multitasking. We also help with chewing and swallowing, making sure it's comfortable, it's sufficient, but also that it's safe. And we're going to talk about that a little bit more later on in the presentation. The last area that we can also help with is managing saliva. And this is an area that's often overlooked, but can be important for not just comfort, but also dignity and many other things that saliva is really helpful for. So drooling, dry mouth, phlegm, we can help work with you and sometimes your dental team to make this better. All right, now here's some audience participation. I want to know, when do you think it's appropriate to seek speech language pathology help? Is that at time of diagnosis? a little bit after diagnosis? Is it late stage management or at any point in your journey with HD? I'll give you a moment to maybe put it in the questions box. I can't see the questions box, but I'll give you a moment to do that. Whether it's one, two, three, or four. 
And the correct answer, if we're ready, is number four, at any point. Even if it's just early on, giving you information, discussing options, and making a plan long before you might be in any crisis situation, or maybe late stage management, helping you with strategies and working with your care partners, for example. At any point, speech language pathologists can help. Now, the Huntington Society of Canada has a wonderful physician's manual, and I really like the way it specifically mentions speech language pathology as being very important to reduce the burden of symptoms, maximize function, and optimize quality of life for people with HD. I do believe this manual is available on their website, and I encourage you to check it out for more information about that. All right, what does SLP intervention look like? The truth is, it can be really customized, and that's going to be dependent on what your goals are, what you need, and what resources are available to you and your pathologist. As I mentioned earlier, for some people, they just want education. So webinars like this, or maybe a consultation with a speech pathologist. Other patients might be interested in an assessment to gauge where they're at, what their risks are, and if there's been any changes from their baseline. From that assessment, we can determine what to do about it, whether that's just strategies for now, whether you're interested in treatment, or something different like joining a group or having just reoccurring follow-ups. Sometimes a speech pathologist will also recommend referrals. So we work closely with ENTs, ear, nose, and throat doctors, also otolaryngologists, dentists, pharmacists, and neurologists, for example. And something else you should know is that many SLPs can see you in person or virtually. So please don't think that that's a barrier for you if you're unable to go to a clinic in person. Let's get started with communication. Now, communication actually involves multiple different components, and I've split them up here for us. The first part of communication is speech. So actual sounds we make to communicate a message. And to make those sounds, we have to articulate our face, turn on our voice box to make that beautiful voice and breathing in the lungs, right? And all of that anatomy has to work together in coordination with good strength and tone in order to make the sounds we want. But it doesn't stop there. There's also the language component. And so this is taking meaning and applying it to sounds. Maybe that's understanding what people around you are saying or finding the words to express your thoughts. And in HD, we know that could be a problem where you know what you want to say, but you can't quite find the word for it. And then when you do find the word for it, sometimes it's difficult to move your body to make the sounds required for it. And then the last part is cognition. So like I mentioned, this is the ability to remember, to pay attention and problem solve on the spot during a conversation with somebody. And if any one of these components is having difficulty, that can affect your communicative success. In speech specifically and HD, there's a few key factors and red flags that as a pathologist or maybe as a person living with HD, you're going to want to look out for. So involuntary movements can impact your ability to move your body for speech. This can lead to breakdowns in your articulation, so difficulty making consonants and vowels properly. Maybe the pacing of your speech feels unusual or unnatural where you go too fast or there's unusual pauses. And sometimes coordinating our breathing with our speech can also be difficult. For some people, it's their voice quality that bothers them the most and results in that speech pathology appointment. So sounding harsh or hoarse or having difficulty maintaining consistent volume. Another thing to keep in mind is expression of the face. We know that with HD, this can become increasingly challenging. And unfortunately, in communication, we rely on facial features quite a bit. So smiling, moving your eyebrows when you talk, this all helps convey your message. Now, I do have a video here. It's quite interesting. It's of an opera singer in an MRI machine. And the great thing about this video is it allows us to see the anatomy of how our muscles move for speech on the inside. Just for time's sake, we are going to skip over this for now, but if at the end of the presentation or if we have time during questions, I'd love for us to watch it together. All right, now on the screen, I have the word dysarthria. 
You don't have to memorize this, but I bring it up because that's the medical term for difficulty speaking due to difficulty moving. So if you hear your doctor or your speech pathologist say dysarthria, what they mean is those speech changes in HD. Now the other components for communication, language and cognition can also be problematic. In HD, we might see things like initiating conversation less, taking longer to respond, and that might be because we're having difficulty organizing our thoughts and finding the words to match our thoughts. Sometimes we might notice that our language is shorter or less complex than it used to be. And sometimes we easily lose attention from topic changes or distractions in the environment. Forgetfulness and inattention, we all do that sometimes in conversation, but if it becomes an ongoing pattern and problem, your speech pathologist can certainly help. So that brings us to intervention opportunities. And I want to remind us that as HD progresses, what works to help us communicate will also progress. So strategies that might work at one point might need to change later on. And strategies that work for one person might not work for another. Because of this, it's really important that you see a speech pathologist early and maintain follow-ups with them to ensure you're getting the best care and the best options for you. For some people, we like to talk about alternative and augmentative communication, which has the acronym AAC. I bring this up because in my experience, this isn't something regularly talked about in the community, but it can be really helpful for people with HD to communicate. So AAC is any method we might use to communicate instead of our speech or in addition to our speech and everybody uses AAC at least from time to time. For example, if you write somebody a letter or send somebody an email or text, you're using alternative communication. You're replacing speech sounds with written communication. If you've ever used a microphone, you're augmenting your speech. So you're still making speech sounds, but you're supplementing the volume in some way. Other people who use AAC a lot are teachers, right? So teachers are communicating quite high level topics like maths and sciences and philosophy, but they're supplementing it with things like pictures and drawings and writing and materials and demonstrations. Now we see technology in the classroom, calculators, iPads, TVs, gestures. All of these things are helping the teacher communicate their message better. And in HD, we can take some of, some of those principles to help us communicate too. Now, like I said, writing down things and texting is very common, something we all do. But in HD, what can happen is it can become difficult to make the movements required to write efficiently. In other cases, it can just be tedious to keep writing down the same thing over and over again. So something like a communication board we might bring up with you or might be appropriate. Um, this can vary in complexity from a yes and no board that you point to all the way to an alphabet board that you can spell words or a picture board. Um, something to keep in mind is that it can be helpful to have this as backup communication. So often our speech is worse when we're stressed or in an emergency situation. And unfortunately, those are often the times where we need our communication the most. Because of this, I do recommend that anyone with HD considers having a backup communication method. And this can be as simple as a little wallet card with an alphabet board you can point to, or your emergency contact information, maybe a brief introduction of who you are that you can just hand out that says, I have HD, it affects my ability to communicate, please be patient, something like that. If you're interested, I do have free downloads on my website, speakstrong.ca. You can just print them up, personalize them however you like, and put them in your wallet. If you're more interested in technology, there's also options for you there. So if pen and paper isn't your thing, there are so many apps that you can use on your phone, on your iPad, anywhere you like to access technology that can also be customized. They can be as simple or as complex as you need and you like. For some people, they just want an alerting tool like a bell or a call monitor in case they had a fall. 
um, in especially later stages of HD, things like photo books and personal dictionaries can really help initiate more successful communication. Pacing boards is another example of AAC where we're supplementing our natural speech. In this instance, if you have difficulty pacing your speech, so going too fast or having too long of pauses, what can be helpful is either just circles on a page or a small board where you physically point to the next item before saying the next word or syllable, and it forces you to normalize and slow down your pace of speech, for example. So these are little tips and tricks that can help some people communicate. Now, if any of those seemed interesting to you, there's a few things I want you to keep in mind. The first is the type that works for you can and usually will change over time. Because of this, learning curves are normal and expected, and it can be beneficial to have these conversations with your speech pathologist before you need them. I love being able to talk about these things with my patients who might not even be having any changes in their speech yet, but are just looking for ideas for the future that they can learn now and personalize now before they're in any sort of crisis situation or having difficulty communicating. Something you can do if you're on a wait list or you haven't seen a speech pathologist yet is to track your symptoms. So I encourage my patients to write down what are you experiencing in regards to your communication or your swallowing? When does it happen? Does something make it better or worse or seem to trigger it? Who notices this and how important is it to you? By writing these things down, you can bring this journal to your neurology or your doctor or your speech pathology appointment, and it can really help us help you. As a gentle reminder, when it comes to communication, we want to focus on the quality of the communication, not just the quantity of information that was received or given. So sometimes it's important to reflect on our communication and think, how do I feel afterwards? What was the true priority of that communication? Was it just social interaction and relationship building? Or was there a key piece of information that I needed to know? Aiming for progress over perfection is important. You know, if things don't go as planned, what can you do next time? And if you identify what can you do next time, how can you break that down into smaller steps? These are all conversations that your speech pathologist is trained to help you through. If you are a person who has a loved one or family member with HD, here's some strategies for you. The first is to ask permission. So if somebody's having trouble finding their words or communicating, that can be a stressful situation and we know that stress makes the problem worse. So sometimes it can be helpful to remove part of that stress by acknowledging competency and leaving space to come back to it. For example, a phrase that might be helpful for you is to say, hey, I know you know what you want to say. Sounds like the words aren't coming out. Do you want my help? And then you're offering that permission before stepping in. You could also try saying something like, hey, right now it seems to be difficult to communicate. Is this something that's important for me to know now? Or would you prefer for us to come back to this later? And again, you've removed some of the stress you've opened up options for the person with HD. Another thing that can be really helpful, and this is to be honest when communicating with anybody, is to recognize the communication burden that you're putting on the other person. So if I were to ask you, what do you want to drink? Well, I've now placed all of the onus on you to know what your options are, decide what you'd prefer, and find the words to express that. If I instead told you, would you like tea, coffee, or juice, I reduced your communication burden by giving you your options and giving you the words for those options ahead of time. If that's still challenging, I can reduce the burden even more by saying, would you like tea? Now you only need to say yes or no, to which I could say, okay, would you like coffee? Yes or no, right? So the complexity of the question we ask impacts the complexity of what the person needs to answer with. So little strategies and tips like this, again, your speech pathologist can train you on to make your communication more successful. And I'm just bringing up a few now so that you have something to walk away with after this presentation. Let's get into swallowing next. This is 
usually a big topic that patients have questions about for me. Now, swallowing also involves multiple steps. There's the actual physical aspect of bringing the food to our mouth. There's the chewing aspect, keeping the food in our mouth, chewing it well, keeping it together. And then there's the throat aspect. So this is getting the food down in a way where we don't feel things are getting stuck um, or making us cough or coming back up again. So if you're noticing issues or changes at any of those steps, if you're noticing your voice sounds wet or gurgly after you eat, or it takes more energy and effort to eat, maybe it's taking you longer, you're having unexplained weight loss or recurrent pneumonias, these are all red flags. Now I'm hoping you'll get a copy of these slides after the presentation. So if you're scrambling to write all this down, don't worry, you will have access to this list later. So why does swallowing matter? Of course, it's important to make sure we have adequate nutrition, hydration, and can take our medications, but it's also important in maintaining healthy amounts of saliva in the mouth and making sure it's comfortable. Swallowing well also helps with your independence and your social connection during mealtimes, but also your safety. So as a speech pathologist, key things that I worry about are obstruction, meaning choking, where something can become lodged in the throat and a patient can't breathe. However, sometimes swallowing problems aren't that overtly visible. Sometimes it's what we call aspiration, where amounts of food, liquid, saliva, or medication might not become lodged and prevent breathing, but bits of them are going down into the lungs. If this happens in a large quantity, or even small amounts over a long period of time, that can increase your risk for pneumonia of the lungs. So here I have a video showing what a normal, typical swallow might look like. And as you saw, it was very quick. The person's already on their second swallow here. Let me pause so I can slow it down for us. I'll bring it back to the start here. All right, so just so we can get some landmark features here, at the front is the nose and the mouth. Here is the tongue, which is a lot bigger than a lot of people realize. We're looking at the person from the side. Down here is the throat. And what you'll see is this large gray structure. That's your trachea. That's the bit that goes down to the lungs. Typically, the food actually wants to slide behind it between this narrow passage to your stomach. And then here's the person's spine and the base of their skull. So if I play this video, oh, and I try to fast forward us a little bit, you'll notice that the white part, which is supposed to depict the food or liquid that this person is swallowing, first gets collected together in a cohesive unit. We call this a bolus in medical terms. So this is the bolus of food. What you'll notice is the tongue after it's collected it, applies pressure to it and then pushes it to the back of the mouth. At this point, most of the food is leaving the mouth and it's starting to go down. However, there's multiple muscles and systems that are working together right now. You'll see this structure here that's bending over. That's called your epiglottis. And what it's supposed to do is like a curtain, fall over your airway to prevent things from going the wrong way. And our body's very smart. What it also will do is it'll take your voice box, your trachea here, and it will pull it up and forwards out of the way so that there's more room for the bolus of food to go behind it down to the stomach. So I'll move forward a little bit so we can see this happening. You'll notice that the airways moved quite a bit forward compared to when the person was just at rest. The epiglottis is fully folded over that airway, protecting it, and the food and liquid is about to slide down the esophagus down to the stomach. All right. The other thing I want you to notice here is that when I'm not playing with it and slowing it down, it's one quick movement, often a movement that we don't have to think about. However, because there's so many components involved, there's mul multiple things that can also go wrong. So here's a video of what can happen when the anatomy is not cooperating with us. You'll see that at the end of this person's swallow, they had that white bolus all throughout their mouth and their throat. So I'm gonna go back to the beginning just so we can go through this a little bit slower. So for this person, they went to swallow and what we'll notice right away is that the bolus is getting split up. 
So the food and liquids now in multiple spots. All right. That epiglottis hasn't really folded over the airway all the way. And so we're seeing some of this white coming forwards. As the swallow progresses, we see more white falling into the airway here. And then we see again, the food and liquid is getting split up throughout the throat. When I keep going forward, we'll see for this person, they still even have some food in their mouth that hasn't gone down. And as the swallow goes on even more, here we go. We see that white part is going down the airway. This is what we would call an aspiration event. So they haven't obstructed their airway. There's still space for air, but there's things that are going down the wrong way, those little bits of food and liquid, okay? And that's something people forget when it comes to choking. It's the little bits of food and liquid that go down the wrong way over time. And here we have it at the end of the swallow. This person may or may not feel that they've still got food stuck in their throat in little places. They still have food in their mouth, things like that. Now here's a real example. So this is an x-ray from the side of real people when they're swallowing. I'm going to draw your attention first to the left, to a normal swallow. And here the black is the food and liquid. So we've kind of reversed the image. I'm going to go back so we can see that again. They go and they swallow and it's gone. One smooth, efficient, safe movement. Now I want to bring your attention to the right side, the abnormal swallow. And here we'll see the black, the food or liquid. It's kind of splitting up in the throat. Some of it's going down into the lungs and coming back up. So I'll bring us back so we can see this part again. You'll see some of the liquid is right above the airway. Some is already spilling into the airway while other food is still not able to get down to the stomach. It's just collecting here. They still got food in their mouth, food stuck at the back of their throat, things like that. Now I'm going to play that um, swallow again because there's something else I want you to notice. All right, so they're swallowing, swallowing, trying to get it down and a lot of it went down the wrong way. But something you may have not noticed is that they didn't cough. So as a speech pathologist, when I see somebody coughing on x-ray, you can usually tell. They're usually rocking forwards and backwards and their mouth opens up wide for that cough. Whereas this person, even though food and liquid was going down the wrong way, their body stayed in pretty much the same position. And this is to highlight a phenomenon called silent aspiration. What silent aspiration means is that things are going the wrong way, but the person might not feel it, so they're not coughing. And this is particularly dangerous because what can happen is, from the outside, somebody with HD looks fine, but on the inside, things are going the wrong way. All right, and this is why it's really important that you see a speech pathology and have a proper assessment. This is also why I like to do video x-rays like this so that I can make sure we're not missing any silent aspiration that we can't see from the outside. Here's another medical word that I'm just giving to you in case you hear your team talk about it, and that's dysphagia. Dysphagia is the medical term for a clinical disorder of the swallowing. Again, assessment and treatments available. So sometimes we'll start off just by watching our patients eat and drink different textures and different liquids where we look for red flags. If we see red flags, we can do that x-ray study that you saw where we take short videos of people while they're eating and drinking. Another option, of course, is called the fiber optic endoscopic evaluation of swallowing. You do not need to memorize that word. I'm just bringing it up so you know that there's options. How this works is we take a camera on a very, very thin wire and we put it in the patient's nose. Now the camera has a small light on the end and as the person's eating and drinking, we can watch them swallowing from inside their throat. Now, this is a great tool for somebody who might not have access to an x-ray machine where they live or might not be appropriate for that kind of study. I will advise you though that in HD, most speech pathologists won't recommend this to you. The reason being, in order to have this done, you have to be able to stay very still. And we know that with HD, sometimes we have movements we don't mean to have. 
Um, and so it depends on the stage you're at and it depends on what your symptoms are. But this one can be tricky in HD, although it is an option for some people. Now, if we do identify that something's going wrong in the swallow, there's some things we can do. So it depends on what your goal is. Is it to improve the safety of your swallow? So reducing the risk of things going down the wrong way or becoming obstructed? Is it to make swallowing more efficient or more enjoyable? Maybe we want to minimize risk, or maybe we just want to make a plan going forwards. So if things get worse or go wrong, what do you want? What are your wishes for how we would intervene? Sometimes that might be modifying the textures we eat. Perhaps certain textures like thin liquids or dry solids were the problem, but other textures were better. Maybe there's therapy and exercises we can do to target specific muscles of the swallow. Maybe there's strategies, routines, or ways we can position our body that makes swallowing safer and more comfortable. Maybe we can add things like utensils and devices that have better grip or weight on them so that you can eat more independently longer. Things like that. Of course, I always encourage a team-based approach. So we'll often work with your dietitian for things like nutrition, a gastroenterologist, if we notice that the esophagus, so the tube from the throat to the stomach is having issues, maybe an uh, ear, nose and throat doctor or otolaryngologist, and other members of your team to keep your swallowing safe. Now here's some strategies we could all do with, whether or not you have HD, to so that can make our swallowing safer. First one is reducing distractions at mealtime so that we can focus on our eating and drinking making sure we're having one bite at a time and pacing ourselves in a way that feels comfortable and safe. Consider timing meals with personal fluctuations. So if there's times of the day where you know you have more difficulty moving or you have difficulty with appetite, we want to avoid meals at those times. Considering meal supervision or other environmental considerations can also be important. Now, what can you start doing right away to reduce your risk of developing a pneumonia or illness from things going into your lungs? There's three main things, and the first one is actually oral care. And this usually surprises people, but the reason it matters so much is that every person from time to time will have food, liquid, or saliva go the wrong way, okay? But not everybody develops a pneumonia. The reason in part is because of our general lung health, how physically active we are, so how strong our lungs are to manage things going down the wrong way, but also how clean we keep our mouth. And the reason for that is all of us have bacteria in our mouth. And if we're not brushing our teeth regularly, we can have a proliferation or more of that oral bacteria than we want, which sticks to food and liquid when we're chewing. Now, if that food and liquid goes the wrong way, it's going to pull that bacteria from the mouth down to the lungs, and that can start a bacterial infection for pneumonia. In fact, what we find and what the research has shown us is that people who brush their teeth very well tend to produce pneumonias less, even if they have a disordered swallow. So brush your teeth regularly and keep it up and start doing it right away. Now, a lot of people will tell me that as a person living with HD, oral health is hard and it's because there's multiple factors that can get in the way, multiple barriers. So nutrition and diet. Sometimes with HD, we're recommended high calorie dense diets to keep our nutrition up, which is fantastic. But of course, high calorie foods tend to lead to more bacteria in the mouth. Sometimes we're also recommended to have smaller meals throughout the day, which introduces more food objects to the oral mucosa, again, increasing the risk for bacteria. Sometimes in HD, the common medications we use have a side effect of dry mouth, and dry mouth loves to attract bacteria, so <laughs> that's another risk factor. Sometimes with HD, we have difficulty controlling our jaw, so we might have an open mouth more often, which can introduce more bacteria. If we have difficulty swallowing, we might have bits of food that stick around in the mouth, which again introduces more bacteria. So there's lots of things working against us. Because of this, I want to remind you the importance of saliva and oral care. 
It's reducing your risk for pneumonia when you brush your teeth well. And saliva has lots of healthy properties for the body. It helps us digest. It helps repair tissues in the mouth. It's antimicrobial and antiviral and antifungal. Um, so if you're struggling with any of these, please speak to your dentist or your dental care team, uh, like your dental hygienist. Now, I do encourage you to consider if you have HD, which can progress over time, that might impact the dental care you're most interested in. So if you are thinking about getting reconstructive work done to the mouth, you might want to talk to your dentist about having it done earlier before your movement symptoms make that surgery more challenging. Another thing to consider with your dentist is whether or not certain procedures might be more appropriate because they're less work to maintain over time. So if you're going in for a dental procedure that's going to require routine surgeries again and again, that might not be appropriate as your HD progresses. So finding alternatives could be a good idea. Therefore, talk to your dentist in advance to make these big, long-term, sometimes 10-year plans to help ensure that you will be covered at all stages. You can also ask about adaptive brushes and equipment to help you be more independent in your oral care for longer. Things like electric toothbrushes, special grips you can put on your toothbrushes or weights can help people maintain their independence there. And then if you have dry mouth, there's actually a lot of over-the-counter products that don't require a prescription, but which can be very helpful. Um, so you can talk to your dentist or even your local pharmacist for things like this. There's different sprays and mouthwashes and toothpastes and gums and candies and all sorts of things that are specifically designed to improve the pH level of your mouth and help reduce dry mouth. Okay. Now that we've spoken about all of that, maybe you're thinking, okay, I do want to see a speech pathologist. I'm interested in those early discussions. I'm interested in seeing what my options are. Or maybe you're already experiencing these symptoms and now that you know there were options for treatment, you wanna get those. So there's three main ways you can access speech pathology. The first is publicly through our public healthcare system. Usually this requires a physician referral, so as a heads up, you might want to start talking to your doctor right away. In my experience, most public options across Canada do also have wait lists. For example, here on Vancouver Island in BC, I've seen wait lists hit three years before. So again, if you think you might want to see a speech pathologist, getting that referral in right away is important. A little trick for this, um, is to know that in the public healthcare system, what typically happens is when your referral is received by the clinic, they triage you. What that means is they look at your symptoms and they compare you to everybody else on the wait list. Then, based on your symptoms, compared to their symptoms, they prioritize you. So, if you get a referral and then maybe later on in the year your symptoms are getting worse, tell your doctor to update your referral. Because if they update your referral with those worsened symptoms, that can help the clinic reprioritize you on the wait list. Now, if you're not interested in public options or you want more in addition to public options, you can also look at private speech language pathology. For this, again, I encourage you to find somebody who has experience and training in HD. In Canada, we have lots of private SLPs, but many of them work in the pediatric world. So you want to find someone who specializes in adults and movement disorders. The other option to seek support is education opportunities like the one you're at today. Um, so things like this can help get the balls rolling, get you thinking and let you know about your options. And as always, the earlier, the better, but at any time, we're here to help. All right, that brings us to the end. I went a, maybe a little bit over what we wanted, but we still have enough time for questions. So I'll stop sharing my screen here so that everybody can see each other. Can you all see me again? Yeah. Perfect. That okay. was wonderful, Jasmine. Thank you so much. I really Thank like you. the videos. That, I'm a visual person, so it's great to see the video. Um, so we'll get into the question and answer portion. We do have some that came up throughout the presentation. Perfect. Um, so I'll give everyone a chance to put in their questions. Again, it's in the Q&A at the top of the screen and you can just submit either anonymously or not and we will 
address them. So our first one, our loved one refuses to admit he has HD. He has started choking mildly once or twice while eating. It's so frightening. How can we minimize choking in a gentle way without talking about HD as the reason for choking? Mm -hmm. That's a really good question. Mm -hmm. So for things like this, we can remember that swallowing and HD can still be separate discussions. So like I said, we all have things go down the wrong way from time to time. OK, we have in the public sphere, for example, people getting referrals without any diagnosis. They're just feeling like things are getting stuck or they're having coughing and choking. And it's still appropriate to get that referral. You don't need a diagnosis for that. Right. Mm -hmm. If you're also looking for some of the strategies that I listed, things like going slower, adjusting meal times for personal fluctuations. You can try some of those and see if they're helpful. You can also, if you want, express how you're looking for ways of improving your swallowing safety. So maybe you're doing strategies like putting your knife and fork down between bites. This is something I do if I notice I'm eating too fast. So I'll take a bite and physically put my knife and fork down on the plate, let go of them. And then when I'm ready for my next swallow, I allow myself to pick up my knife and fork. And just that microsecond of putting things down is something other people might not notice, but which helps you swallow safer, right? That's a so really good point. By modeling those behaviors, you could help your person with each, uh, your loved one uh, with their diagnosis. Beautiful. I love that answer. Um, the second one. So my husband hasn't been able to go to the dentist for years due to Korea. Any suggestions on how to sorry, on how to have a safe dental appointment. He needs it. Great question. And actually, I I think that your HD Society of Canada has a handout on oral care tips and tricks. So there is actually on the website, if you, I, I wonder if I can include it in the slide somewhere, um, but there are options. So some dentists will use conscious sedation, for example, different ways that we can help reduce those movements. You do have to find a trained dentist who's comfortable with that, experienced in that, and has the resources for that, but that can be something to consider. Um, and again, it'll depend on your medical background and what you can tolerate, but there are options like that. Um, so you can ask around, see if any dentists offer that service. Beautiful. Um, okay, the next one there is how often should I visit an SLP? Oh, I love this question. <laughs> okay, so it depends on you. So I would suggest that if you're doing um, an assessment as soon as possible, and once you're on the uh, SLP's caseload, you want to see the SLP. I would, in my experience, I like to see my patients, even if they have no change in symptoms, at least once a year, just to keep those baseline measures. Um, if you are experiencing changing symptoms, you want to see your SLP sometimes every three to six months. Again, it really depends on how fast you're progressing and what your symptoms are. If you're in treatment, there are treatments where maybe you're seeing your SLP a couple times a week for a little while, right? Just to get that therapy in. So it's going to depend on what your symptoms are and how fast they're progressing. Beautiful. Um, okay, next one. My loved one is very frustrated communicating, but it is not, but is not open to using assistive tools. How can we work together to show him some support? Yes, and that's the thing about assistive tools is sometimes it makes us feel like our communication is different to other people. And that's why I like to highlight teachers use it. We all use it. Um, so I like to use AAC myself. So if I am trying to communicate with somebody, I'll write down keywords of my message, just modeling that behavior, showing that it's OK, it's comfortable. Um, there's other ways you can use AAC that aren't as obvious as well. So. Um, little alphabet boards where maybe you just point to the first letter of the word people are having trouble with. It doesn't have to necessarily be a big computer screen with an eye gaze tracking device that makes loud sounds, right? Yeah. So <laughs> there, there's ways to kind of adjust it for you um, and opening up that conversation. And if the person really isn't open to it, that's okay too. We can work on partner communication strategies. What that means is we take people in their life who they frequently communicate with, family, friends, loved ones, and we train them on strategies to improve communication. So the things I mentioned earlier, common phrases that are helpful, ways you can reduce the complexity and the communication burden of conversations to improve the success without even using AAC tools. Beautiful. 
Thank you. Um, These are great questions, by the way. Keep them coming <laughs> if you can. <laughs> I think we only have one left. Okay. Um, so since my partner has moved to a swallow safe diet, I have noticed that, sorry, I have noticed they are losing weight. How can I make sure the food they are eating is safe, but they are getting enough calories? Yes, this is a multidisciplinary question, meaning it usually suggests you need more people on your team. So as a speech pathologist, we can work with you to make sure you're swallow safe, but if it means you're eating foods less or they're not as enjoyable to you, let's get a dietitian involved. For example, something I've commonly seen is people are put on softer foods, but it might not be as appetizing to the person with HD. So perhaps we have to work with a dietitian on ways we can adjust temperature and flavor to make food more exciting, more enjoyable, or higher in calories, right? So um, bringing on more members of the team like a dietitian is a good approach there. And talking with your doctor as well. Sometimes patients tell me, I'm eating a lot, maybe I'm eating more because it's more comfortable and I'm still losing weight. That's usually a sign that your doctor needs to take a look to make sure nothing else is going on. Very interesting. Mm. Yeah. Um, sorry, we have one more. Oh, um, yay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my daughter has trouble swallowing and her food is put sorry, need to zoom in on this, my eyes. Uh, and her food is putting consistency. She has late stage HD and her throat hurts. How can she be helped? Ah, so on pudding, did I hear that right? She's having to pudding. pudding. Yeah. Pudding. Okay. This sounds like a redo of that x-ray swallow study might be important. So as your symptoms change, you might need that study done again and again, right? Um, so like I said earlier, I have patients, or even once a year, if we're noticing changes, we'll do that study again. Are the muscles moving differently? And is there anything we can do to make it more effective? If pudding is the softest we can go, sometimes they're swallowing maneuvers. So ways we position our body physically so that gravity can help us out the size of the bites, um, different things like that that we can use so that even if we can't go softer, we can help the swallow in a different way. So the best way to tell that would be through swallow imaging again. Interesting. So you can have that more times than just the first time. You can do you request that. Hopefully your speech pathologist will advocate for it for you. <laughs> uh, that is one thing I will say. Sometimes it can be challenging to access the x-ray suites. I know that here on the island, we only get so many x-rays a week. And so once that's capped out, our patients have to wait the next week and the next week. Right. Um, so again, that's that's why those early discussions are important and getting on the list for it. Um, but yes, you can have them done multiple times. One thing I really like to do is if I suggest therapy, so physical exercises for the throat based on swallow imaging, after we do a lot of therapy, I'll do the imaging again to see the before and after. That way I know what did the exercises actually do? Did they help or do we need to adjust them again? Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then another one from a carer. Sadly, I have tried to hire a speech and language uh, specialist. Uh, how do I find someone in the Okanagan who is specialized and can follow up? So much ends up on my plate and I'm burnt out. A hundred percent. It's a full time job having or helping somebody with HD, right? There's so mm -hmm. many different appointments and professionals. Um, I guess it depends on whether you're looking for public or private options. Um, so in BC, if you're in the Okanagan, um, I'm trying to think what the closest public clinic would be to the Okanagan. You might qualify for virtual services if there's nowhere close or if the wait list is too long. So um, other clinics and health authorities near you might have speech pathologists and you could see them virtually could be an mm -hmm. option. Um, privately, there's Speech and Hearing BC. They have a website that lists private practitioners. Um, unfortunately, it does not specify what the speech pathologist specializes in. So you often need to call around and say, hey, have you seen somebody with HD? Do you have experience with HD? Are you just a pediatric speech pathologist who doesn't even see adults, right? Um, 
I see people across BC, so if you're interested, you can reach out. And if you don't want to work with me, I can look at other colleagues I can connect you with. Um, but yeah, Speech and Hearing BC would be an option for private and then for public. If there's no one near you, thinking about virtual options from nearby health authorities. Beautiful. And sorry, Speech and Hearing BC is at the website? Like yes. Com? Yeah. Okay. Perfect. yeah. So that's the Association for Speech Pathologists in BC. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. Right. Uh, unfortunately, we're not able to, um, if you have your hand up, if you want to throw in a question in the Q&A box, um, then we can address those ones. Uh, I think that is it for questions, though. I'll give you a few more minutes. Thank you so much, Jasmine. You've been a gem. It's been amazing. Uh, you're a great presenter. That's all I can say. <laughs> uh, well, well, it's easy when I have a good team to work with. <laughs> yeah, I, I, re I really enjoy this. I think it's really important that people have access to this information um, mm. because that helps you make better decisions for yourself. Right. So um, I'm always happy to answer questions if you ever want to reach out to me. Um, I'm even happy to share my email if that would be useful. Uh, because, yeah. yeah, this is important. And like I said, asking your questions and that early intervention and that ongoing management is all crucial. Beautiful. Well, uh, I think that seems to be all the questions today. Um, if anyone else has any questions that come to them, please feel free to email them to events at huntingtonsociety.ca and we will be sure to pass them along to Jasmine on your behalf and return to you with their responses. Um, and we'll of course pass along some of the contact information and, and websites and resources that were mentioned today in the presentation. Thank you again, Jasmine, for your wonderful presentation. Uh, we appreciate the valuable insights that you've shared and that you are so giving on your time on behalf of our community. Uh, you will receive, everybody, will receive a recording of the presentation as well as a survey to provide some feedback for us to help improve our future community education forums. Um, just going to double check that Q&A one more time. Let me just see if we have anything else before I let you go. <laughs> okay. Well, we will hope you will join us for our next <laughs> webinar on October 19th with Jimmy Powell Pollard. Everyone enjoy the rest of your weekend, everyone. Thank you, Jasmine, again. And for having me. <laughs> absolutely. Bye now. All right. Bye, everyone.